The Christian Andriacchio case was prematurely closed by authorities, but many questions remain. Come behind the curtain and follow private investigator Sheila Wysocki as she uncovers the truth about what happened to Christian. This is Without Warning. Warning, the following episode contains elements that are graphic in nature. Listener discretion is advised. There has been a lot of talk about Christian, his text messages, and his relationships. One relationship that hasn't been explored is Dylan Swearingen and Christian. What is missing from the case file is the text messages and the deterioration of the relationship. Christian spelled it out with Dylan, but Dylan left that fact out when he was interviewed about the case. Their relationship was not good. But Dylan left out that fact when he was interviewed about the case. At the time of Christian's death, Dylan and Christian were not best friends or even hanging out very much together. Why? Let's explore. Dylan graduated from Northeast High School. He was involved in a motor vehicle accident around the 10th grade, which traumatized him. His friend was killed in the car accident. Dylan did not attend school for a year due to panic attacks and PTSD symptoms. Dylan lived across the street from Whitley's grandmother, and the two started socializing. Dylan was described as being quiet and anxious. Christian knew Dylan, but they really did not hang out with the same peer group. Dylan was involved in a relationship with a girl that ended badly for him. It took him a long period of time to get over this girl, and it was around this time that Christian and Avery broke up for the last time, and this triggered their friendship between Christian and Dylan due to both of them basically being newly single and on the rebound. Dylan appears to have been a supportive friend to Christian for the first few months of their friendship. At some point around July or August of 2013, Dylan began using drugs more heavily, and Christian told Whitley he did not want her socializing with Dylan due to his drug use and what Christian felt was a bad influence on Whitley. When Christian moved to Willow Ridge Apartments, Dylan began going over to the apartment when Christian was on the boat. Going by the content of Christian's text messages, Whitley's aunt, known as Mimi on the text messages, Kimberly, also stayed at the apartment a lot. Christian appeared to be upset about the relationship between Dylan and Kimberly to the point he was going to expose it to Houston, who was also friends with Christian. Josh also recounts an altercation between Dylan and Christian at a party in December. Christian and a friend of Christian's threatened Dylan due to his relationship with Kimberly. It was also noted that Christian was not texting or calling Dylan anymore, and there appeared to be a strain in their relationship. They definitely were not best friends that Dylan has attempted to portray. So Christian is going to call Dylan in an emergency because they're such close friends, according to Dylan. But remember, Christian is telling Whitley to stay away from Dylan. Christian is removing himself from Dylan. So we are to believe that Christian called Dylan in an emergency because they're such close friends According to witnesses, Dylan goes to Anderson ER two days before Christian is killed, secondary to drug withdrawals. Dylan told witnesses he was taking so much of a drug that he was afraid he was going to unintentionally overdose. The hospital treated him for several hours, and then he was transferred to another hospital for drug detox. According to our witnesses, Dylan stayed less than 24 hours, and then he checked himself out. This would be the morning of the 25th. 
One of our witnesses mentioned that he hadn't had drugs for 24 to 36 hours. He would be starting, quote, dope sick symptoms and would need money immediately. That brings us up to the 25th. Witnesses told us that Dylan tends to assume a victim role in most situations. He appears to be, quote, weak link in the cast of characters. When interviewing different people in this case, Dylan over and over was referred to as the weak link in the cast of characters. But they also pointed out that he has an anger or an underlining resentment of people he feels that have it easier than him, whether socially or financially. Several witnesses said he can be very vindictive when rejected, which pauses me to ask the question, what truly was his relationship with Christian? Several witnesses pointed out that Dylan knows his way around phones. He knows how to fix them, and he's very good at getting into phones. So when Whitley's phone was broken, he supposedly took it over to AT&T to get it fixed. Whitley's phone being broken is another fluid story, but the police were told that Christian broke Whitley's phone, so Dylan the very supportive friend that he is, and the tech-savvy guru is going to go over to AT&T and supposedly fix the phone. The witnesses I spoke to said he wouldn't have to go to AT&T in order to get the phone fixed. He would have been able to do it himself. Our witness also said he tends to be overly involved in relationships, whether it's friends or girlfriends. We were told that Dylan feeds off the fact that he can fix phones and break into phones and he is tech savvy. That's where he gets his self-esteem. Also talking to some of the people that have worked with him, they said that he has a poor self-image and is very socially awkward. When we tried to talk to Dylan on several occasions to get his side of the story, What we noticed was Dylan uses his girlfriend as his protector. Through the tip line, we also got tips that not only does his girlfriend protect him, but his mother does as well. We were told that Dylan always plays the victim and they are there to protect him. Teddy Roosevelt was renowned for his love of the outdoors, but few people know that one risky excursion almost cost him his life. Against the Odds is a podcast from Wondery about the unsinkable human spirit and our ability to fight back and triumph against all odds. Each season shares thrilling true stories of survival, putting you in the shoes of the heroes who live to tell the tale. The newest season, Uncharted, Teddy Roosevelt's Amazon Expedition, tells the tale of Teddy Roosevelt's expedition to map an unexplored river in one of the most dangerous parts of the Amazon basin. After leaving the Oval Office in his 50s, the restless president was ready for new adventures. From the Spanish-American War Service to big game hunts, Roosevelt was no stranger to death-defying endeavors, but he was woefully unprepared for the unique dangers and brutality of the jungle. His fateful journey was met with starvation, crippling disease, even murder, and you'll never believe how he got out alive. Follow Against the Odds wherever you get your podcast. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Mike J. and I went to Meridian to follow up on some interviews. When we were there, we stopped by Dylan's to see if he would talk to us. We want his side of the story. Here is Mike talking about his observations when we went to Dylan's apartment. One of my favorite Meridian parts, though, was Dylan. Dylan lives in an apartment with his girlfriend, and I've never seen anybody hide behind women more than Dylan Swearingen. 
anytime we go to talk to Dylan, some lady is in our face telling us to get lost or whatever. He doesn't have whatever, I don't know, he doesn't ever want to talk to us. We'll see him peeking out of the blinds of the apartment. The girl he lives with, her mother runs the apartment complex, which complicated us talking. Sheila and I went down and knocked on the door, and the girlfriend was very nice to us at first. And then it's just kind of like it started building. The anger started building in her, and then before she told us off. And we knew Dylan was behind the front door because of two things. Number one, we could hear him scurrying. And number two, there's a dog barking, and suddenly the dog goes silent when someone approaches. And the dog's only going to go silent if the owner or somebody the dog's comfortable with is quieting the dog. And so we knew Dylan was behind the door, and the girlfriend's out there you know, cursing at us or whatever. Another thing with Dylan, we had found out where he worked, and of course we went over there and he was no longer working there. There seems to be a pattern of him not keeping employment. Whitley and Dylan are two key people that we wanted to get additional information from. A lot of things have come to light we wanted more clarity on. Now, Dylan had a very close relationship with his maternal grandfather. He appeared to have been a father figure to Dylan most of his life. Looking at the overall profile of Dylan, he does not appear to be a happy person. He's been in and out of jail, and we'll talk about that more later. His friendship with Christian was not in a good place. His relationship was going to be exposed, and he potentially could be losing three people in his life at the time of Christian's death. Again, hearing that he has this underlying resentment for people that he feels like has it easier than him, you got to wonder if he felt Christian had it easier than him, and there was jealousy or anger towards Christian, plus his friendship was being rejected at that time. Not to mention that he was coming off of drugs at the time of Christian's death. All that combined, was it the perfect storm? Now that you have a background and a profile of Dylan, let's go through some of the areas of the police report, and what he told investigators. Let's see if we can figure out what was going on. Dylan told the police that when he and Christian arrived at the apartment that morning, Whitley and Christian immediately began arguing. Dylan then said during the argument, Christian put a gun to his head and threatened to shoot himself. Whitley, however, never mentioned this incident to the police. I am sure you're asking the same questions I am asking. Where did the gun come from? Was it on Christian the whole time, or did it just appear? Did Dylan and Christian stop at Christian's lockbox and pick up the gun? Common sense would dictate you ask questions like that. Dylan says that after Christian and Whitley calmed down, he told them he was going to leave and get food and asked if they wanted anything. The Chick-fil-A story is very fluid. Depending on who you're listening to or what report you're reading, Dylan has Chick-fil-A before and after and in between the gun incident. Dylan finally lines up the Chick-fil-A story with Whitley. Dylan says Christian gave him his debit card and told him to pick up the food. Remember, Dylan has been in the hospital. He's coming off of drugs. And Christian then, we are to believe, hands him his debit card. Okay, so let's go through this. Christian and Whitley fight. He puts a gun to his head. When everything calms down, Dylan is given Christian's debit card to go get food and also told him to go to the credit union to get the money out of his account. Now, remember, Dylan had been in the hospital. He is detoxing from drugs. He hasn't had drugs between 24 and 48 hours based on what our witnesses have told us. And Christian's giving him his debit card, even though their relationship is very strained. Christian's rejected him and told Whitley to stay away from him. 
And in addition, he's going to stop at the phone store to fix Whitley's phone. Oh, and by the way, the AT&T store, they no longer offered repair at that store location. And Dylan knew it. Daily Harvest is a proud sponsor of Without Warning Podcast. We're all overbooked, constantly running on empty. For me, I'm always rushing to produce episodes and then working through my investigations. I barely have enough time to eat complete meals, let alone prepare healthy ones. But being busy doesn't mean you have to resort to takeout or overly processed food. That's why I love Daily Harvest. I have it available not only for myself or the company that comes to visit. Daily Harvest gives me the option of having more fruits and vegetables and thoroughly sourced chef crafted foods for myself and my company. I am able to choose 65 different options like smoothies, hearty soups, harvest bowls, lattes, and overnight oats. It's so convenient. I just reach into the freezer, pull out what I need, and I'm able to eat it at my desk or on the go. Go to dailyharvest.com and enter promo code WOW to get $25 off your first box. That's promo code WOW for $25 off your first box at dailyharvest.com. dailyharvest.com. StoryWorth is a proud sponsor of Without Warning Podcast. I was already a subscriber of StoryWorth. My son gave it to me as a present, so I know the benefits of StoryWorth. I am a big fan. StoryWorth sends a question each week. I can type a paragraph or I can write a novel. I can put a picture or not. I email it and it's set. At the end, they put a book together and all the questions that have been asked and answered are put into a book for us to keep. My son and I talk about some of the questions. He gets an email of the story and we can talk about it. I am able to pass down memories with my son and have a keepsake. Join me each week and fill out your story worth memory. Preserve and pass on memories with story worth the most meaningful gift for your family. Sign up today by going to storyworth.com slash wow. You'll get $20 off your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash wow for $20 off. You will enjoy the process and the memories. Now let's go to the credit union. Dylan goes to the credit union to withdraw money around 1230. That is what is on video. He was not able to withdraw the money because he didn't have Christian's PIN number. Why would you not pick up the phone and call your, quote, best friend to get his PIN number? Remember, he's home watching a movie with Whitley. On the credit union video, Dylan is seen on the phone talking to someone when he leaves the bank. After Dylan leaves the bank and he's on his way back to the apartment, he stops at Best Buy. So let's play this out as if Dylan did go to Best Buy. He would park the car, walk in, go into Best Buy and do what? Talk to this employee for how long? And then leave? What time? Walk back to the car get into the car, and then drive to his next location, which was the apartment? How long would that take? And don't you think if the police were questioning you, you would go to that employee and say, hey, man, do you remember that I was there? Or get the video from Best Buy? There's no better witness than being on a video at Best Buy at the time you say you are. So far, the only picture of Dylan being anywhere is at the bank at 1230. So he's gone to get food, to the bank, to Best Buy. Oh, and don't forget AT&T. But according to our witness, Dylan said that AT&T was too busy for him to fix the phone that day. 
Remember, they had closed down the repair department, and he's now back at the apartment. This is where Dylan goes into the apartment, sees that Whitley is asleep on the couch, and then he starts looking for Christian. He does that well check upstairs in the bathroom. Of course, during the well check, Dylan said that he never entered the bathroom and never touched Christian's body. Then how did he get gunpowder residue on him if he was never in the area? Now let's go through some of the statements that Dylan made to different investigators. Dylan tells an investigator that when the police arrive at the apartment, the police state that they are going to do a GSR test and that if Dylan or Whitley had shot guns, that they would test positive. That's when Whitley said that she had been shooting on a country road. Gun night first came from Dylan. Next, Christian and Whitley had been fighting over another boy that she had been hanging out with. Christian came home because Whitley spent the night with this boy. Quote, his name is Matt Miller, end of quote. Whitley does not bring up Matt Miller in her police statement, nor to her interview with the investigator. Dylan is also the source for the statement that Christian had put a tracking program on Whitley's phone. He told the investigator that Andriacchio had placed a tracking program on Goodman's cellular phone, and it showed that she was spending a lot of time at Matt Miller's residence. In Dylan's first statement, after Christian supposedly holds a gun to his head, it magically disappears and they watch a movie. When Dylan's talking to the investigator, he changes his narrative. The detail of watching a movie that Dylan included in his first statement does not get mentioned during that interview. Dylan is also the source of the yelling and arguing between Whitley and Christian. Dylan was the one who said, Christian yelled, do you love me? In the first statement, when Christian held the gun to his head, Dylan was present. In the second statement, when he talks to the investigator, Dylan's upstairs peering over the guardrail and hears Christian say, do you love me? Dylan is the source that Christian was angry and threw Whitley's phone against a wall and broke it. But being a good friend, he's the one who's going to go get it fixed. Dylan was the source of the word suicide. He was the one who made the 911 call and said, we have a suicide. Even though it was Dylan who said he opened the door and did not touch the body after his well check. Dylan is the source of that information. Does it make it true if Dylan said Christian told me to take all of his money and gave me his card, but didn't give me his PIN number? So we are to believe that Dylan is such a good friend to Christian that he is going to give him all of his money before he takes his life. He's not going to give it to his brother or his sister or leave it for his mom but Dylan is the one person he picked for the money. Or give it to Whitley, who supposedly is the love of his life. No, Dylan's the one he's going to give the money to. He's going to give him all his money, but not give him his PIN number. Angie's list is now Angie, and we've heard a lot of theories about why. I thought it was an eco-move. Fewer words, less paper. No, it was so you could say it faster. No, it's to be more iconic. Must be a tech thing. But those aren't quite right. It's because now you can compare upfront prices, book a service instantly, and even get your project handled from start to finish. Sounds easy. It is, and it makes us so much more than just a list. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I. Or download the app today. Now let's talk about when Dylan met with Joe Andriacchio. After the death of Christian, Dylan went over to ask about the life insurance policy for Whitley. 
if we are to believe that Dylan is afraid that Whitley is going to pin this on him, as he supposedly told his grandfather, then why would he continue to supposedly be Whitley's errand boy? A theme that was very apparent when interviewing Christian's friends. Dylan was not Christian's friend. Dylan was Whitley's friend. One of Christian's friends talks about Dylan coming around after Christian's death. Each time, Dylan would begin asking questions regarding what he heard about Christian's death and what Whitley may have been saying about the death. When pulling all this information together, it is important to look at sources. Where does the information come from? Who says it? And are they consistent? One thing I can say, Dylan is not consistent. The information he shares, he changes. It's very fluid. Look at the discrepancies. Everyone who's listening knows that the investigation was botched badly. Even the investigators have said it was botched badly. And in the meeting of the Meridian Minds, they agree the investigation was botched. The difference is you all are smart enough to look at the inconsistencies and see there's a problem. If we are to believe that Dylan did everything he said that day, from going to Chick-fil-A, Best Buy, AT&T, we know he went to the credit union. How much time would that take? Getting in and out of the car, driving to the places, talking to a Best Buy employee, or walking in and waiting for a few minutes at an AT&T store that doesn't have a repair department. Maybe this is a really simple case. The science lines up that it was not suicide. The stories are inconsistent. When you do an investigation, you look at the whole. You look at everything from the text messages, the investigation, interviewing witnesses. All of it needs to be taken into consideration. But one thing that really needs to be taken into consideration is the motive of the person giving the information. Should you dive deeper into what they tell you? The source of the information is Dylan. Everyone knows this investigation was botched, including the people that performed the investigation or didn't perform the investigation. They admitted on tape it was botched from the beginning. This is not a difficult case. The information from the witnesses on that day don't line up. Anybody reading through the case file can see for themselves the inconsistencies. You have to ask yourself common sense questions. I want to leave you with some jailhouse chatter. When people are in jail, they become very chatty. Dylan is no exception to that rule. Since Christian's death, Dylan has been in and out of jail. One of his former cellmates or podmates or whatever they call it in jail. This is part of the text message that was shared. D. Dylan. Dylan set some cat up on some shit for some money and him and another dude shot him and made it look like a suicide while his bitch was in there tripping on bars. But they was all effed up and couldn't even get any money. I want to thank Jenny Moore for putting the research together on this episode. I couldn't have done it without her. Lori Morrison, who you've heard on Without Warning before, a private investigator and friend, is about to start her first podcast. Here is Lori talking about her podcast and the debut. There are so many red flags in Dylan's various statements and accounts of what happened the day Christian died. Timelines don't match forensics don't match, and his demeanor doesn't match the situation, especially if you watch the Crime Watch Daily interview. But to me, the most glaring red flag is Christian's gun. Dylan says he took it away from Christian because he felt that Christian was suicidal. But within hours, 
He decides Christian is all better and not only gives him the gun back, but then leaves the apartment. Then he says when he comes back, he can't find Christian and assumes he's taking a shower. He calls out to him, but gets no answer. This does not seem to alarm him at all. He cannot get a response from a supposedly suicidal young man who he returned a loaded weapon to, and he is not alarmed. My feeling is that he's not bothered because he already knows what condition Christian is in. He already knows that Christian is dead because he was involved in what happened to Christian. It's been my privilege to have been involved with Sheila and Ray in working on Christian's case. And to everyone listening to the podcast, you're amazing. Your tips, your insights, and your support have been off the charts phenomenal. I would like to take this opportunity to invite each of you to join me on January 7th when I launch The Unlovely Truth, a podcast where we're going to explore the intersection of faith and true crime. Check out The Unlovely Truth Podcast on Instagram or join the discussion on our Facebook page. Just search for The Unlovely Truth. You can also visit theunlovelytruth.com and sign up for our email list so you will always have the latest info. The next episode will be on Whitley. Because it's taking a little more time to pull all the interviews together, I'm going to take a break. The episode will be announced when it's ready. In between that time, I will be talking to my Patreon people and sharing some behind-the-scenes information. I will continue the conversation with bonus episodes on my Patreon page without warning. Please go to withoutwarningpodcast.com and buy a t-shirt and show your support to Christian Andriacchio. Christian's family gives their full permission for any and all details to be shared and hope that the truth will come out. If you know anything at all, call 1-888-599-0008 or email tips at sheilawysaki.com. If you or someone you know is dealing with suicidal ideation or is actively thinking about taking their life, please call the National Suicide Hotline at one 800 273 8255. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, join Patreon today. Without warning, executive director, executive producer, and host, Sheila Waisaki. Mix and mastering by Resonant Recording. And announcer, Tim Evans. <laughs>